We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Hello everyone, I'm Travis Blair, I'm the Director of Biotech and Research here at Oxford University. <coughs> so I get the pleasure of introducing today's talk as the uh, speaker is a member of the Biotech and Research Centre. So the centre is a um, centre for research excellence, one of the national centres set up by the government and it has five partner organisations. Uh, the speaker today comes from Ag Research originally, one of the partners, Plant and Food Research, Scion, uh, Massey University, and our host organisation is Lincoln University. And we are dedicated to fundamental research on invertebrate pests, weeds, and diseases of plants in New Zealand for the benefit of all New Zealand. Cross sectoral organisation, cross sectoral focus, fundamental, trying to improve the applied control of these plant issues. So today's talk is very pertinent for um, one of our main efforts, which is around the enhancement of biological control approaches in New Zealand. So today, uh, Professor Stephen Goldson is going to talk to us about oh, keeping pests on a short leash, changing biocontrol in New Zealand's vast ecosystems. Now, Steve Goldson has a very long and distinguished history in New Zealand. He got his PhD um, at this very institute when it was Lincoln College, so his PhD is actually from Canada University. We may end up back there very soon, but it's um, the, um, he, He's also worked as the Chief Advisor for the Biosecurity Minister, Simon Upton, uh, and he was actually Science Minister as well. He is currently also a Strategic Advisor to to um, Whiteman. To, to, um, Steve has worked for many years for, for math and then ag research, and really his whole career has been devoted to improving biocontrol systems in New Zealand through his understanding of um, both entomology, parasitology, and the ecosystems of New Zealand. So he has led uh, three very successful introduction programs in New Zealand. I doubt very many people in the world can say they've been associated with three successful biocontrol programs on this scale. So we're very lucky to have him. He's a national treasure. <laughs> <laughs> and so without any further ado, I will turn over to Stephen. Uh, thank you, Travis, for those kind words, and thank you all for coming tonight. I'm very grateful that you're here. The weather's terrible, so thank you for making the effort. Uh, yes, I did lead three out of three successful biocontrol programs, and it's turned out it's nothing to do with me. It's something to do with our ecology, which is the talk I'm going to give this evening. So, the first thing I've got to do is acknowledge my numerous colleagues who've worked with me. I did my PhD on this weevil. Travis omitted the fact that I had an unsuccessful outing as a corporate manager for about 10 years, and then came back to uh, what I was working on. The strange bookend to my career is I did do my PhD in Lincoln College working on Argentine stem weevil, and I may end my career working on uh, Argentine stem weevil at Lincoln College, I'm not sure, but we'll see. But it has a strange symmetry to it. Anyway, I won't go through all these names, uh, but the first group I must acknowledge is um, the old group in agri-research in the 1990s. There are several colleagues who've worked with me very hard on this same subject, and more recently, some very distinguished people um, who've joined the group since. Now, I just want to give a caveat here. Um, quite a lot of what I'm talking about is work in progress. And some of the work I'm talking about is hyper some of the results and interpretations I'm giving are hypothetical. So that not everything I'm going to say is proven, but that's the nature of science. And some of the, some of the conclusions we're drawing are quite controversial because some of the conclusions we're drawing are quite unusual. 
So getting straight into it, this is the weevil, and it's helpful to remember it's about the size of a match head. And this is its natural enemy, called Microtonus hyperodi. I think Microtonus means little murderer, or little killer in Greek, and it's well named. <clears throat> it's a very small wasp. It's a bit smaller than the weevil. I think I got the scales wrong a bit, but it's rough enough. <clears throat> So the weevil itself was first described in New Zealand in 1927. It had probably been here a lot earlier than 1927. It's a, as I said, it's about the size of a ryegrass seed, and I think probably it came over as part of the ryegrass trade with New Zealand in the 1900s, early 1900s. So by the time it was described here in 1927, it was more or less spread all over the place. Um, <coughs> The point about it is it's reached colossally high densities, around 500 per square meter. I did do some work in South America. I think in its indigenous range where it came from, you'd be lucky to find one per square meter. So it's quite a different animal here compared to what it's like in South America. So um, it's extremely damaging to improved ryegrass. It is indeed the worst ryegrass pest in New Zealand, which is quite something given that ryegrass has been estimated by Treasury, I think, or MPI, to be worth $17 billion a year. So a bad pest of ryegrass really is quite something. So I, this um, is actually part of my PhD I did all those years ago, and that grass has pretty much been killed off by the Argentine stem weevil. The way it kills the grass is that the grubs live inside the stems and each um, stage, if you like, each individual, uh, what are the grubs associated with each individual will kill up to five tillers. So you can wipe pastures out, as shown here. There is some adult feeding here, which is largely trivial except on seedlings, and I'll show you in a minute. This is um, some um, minimum tillage. These are drill rows where there's supposed to be grass growing the weevil has killed all the grass. This is an aerial photo. We're very pleased with this. We took this with a drone. So we took lots of pictures and one finally showed the ground. Most of the time it was <laughs> flying on its side or taking pictures of the sun. But this one is a cheap drone. Anyway, here you can see uh, where there's been damage by Argentine stem weevil. And here this lot's been protected and Federico took that picture. This is um, what I was talking about. The adults, which don't affect mature pasture, kill the seedlings after um, conservation tillage. So the little seedlings come up, the adults nip the seedlings off, and you finish up with this effect. Now this effect is often attributed to poor seed or bad drills or bad farming practice. It really does get misinterpreted quite often uh, to be something other than Argentine stem weevil. So in 1991, Ron Prestige and Peter Pottinger and Gary Barker, who I think is here, is that you again? What if, that's embarrassing. Anyway, I'll carry on. <laughs> um, estimated the damage to be between 78 million and 251 million dollars a year to the farming industry. Uh, now that damage caused by Argentine stem in 1991 was really serious. There was nothing going on to, to manage it. Uh, then, um, some of you may have heard of this um, endophyte, which is a fungus that grows within the plant itself. That confers resistance to Argentine stem weevil. So the problem was reduced considerably by endophyte, but in combination with the endophyte came the parasitoid. So we had a very good combination of controls, endophyte and the parasitoid. The parasitoid is useful because sometimes the endophyte in some types of grass doesn't work very well. And often that effect I showed you where the seedlings are mown down um, endophyte doesn't work particularly well in that situation either. Just before I go on, this isn't really a talk about Argentine stem weevil itself. It's a bit of a talk about what can happen in biocontrol in New Zealand. So really, while I'm talking about one system, it can apply to others. So what's classic? What is biocontrol? At its simplest, it really is very simple. Many of our pest species are from overseas, particularly these weevil species in pasture. 
So the obvious thing is to go to where they came from and see if you can find some natural enemies and simply bring them in and let them go. Now, immediately you've got problems with that because they have to stick to their knitting. If we bring things in that wipe out native species or beneficial species like bees, we're in real trouble. When it does work, it's very, very good. It's self-sustaining, it's economically hugely efficient, environmentally friendly, it's got everything going for it. But the hook is that there's not a biocontrol solution for every problem in New Zealand or anywhere else. So politically, it's easy to wave your arms and say, I'll just bring in a biocontrol agent. Practically, it's very difficult. And that's because only about 10% of biocontrol attempts have ever done anything. Now, as Travis kindly said, we've had three biocontrol successes out of three in pastures. But, and it's worth, obviously, hundreds of millions of dollars a year to New Zealand. But that may be illusory, and that's partly what I want to talk about this evening. So I'm going to talk, my talk, the talk, comprises two bits. One's called the glory years, and the other's called, that's part one, and the other bit's called consternation and discovery, which is part two. So I'm going to talk about the glory years first. So the talk, the glory years bit, will comprise uh, a bit of a conversation about the pest, the parasitoid, something about our pastures, which all led to a great success. So talking about the weevil, which you've just heard about, the thing to note is, the thing to note is it reproduces sexually. So it can evolve. The alleles get, I'm getting out of tr into trouble here, there's a, a resorting of alleles which lead to adaptation, which means it can change. Talk about the parasitoid bit more fully. The parasitoid, <coughs> a little killer, reproduces parthenogenetically, which means that it just produces clones of itself. Obviously it's female, and all it does is produce absolutely identical females. There's very little scope for it to evolve, so it's pretty much stuck in the groove that it's been in for who knows how long. So it's not got the options to evolve. So we did the obvious thing. We went to South America at about the same latitudes as New Zealand. This is all temperate South America. And we looked for the weevil. And then having found the Argentine stem weevil, we then found out whether the parasite was in it or not. And we went to all kinds of places. So this is South Brazil. It's really, hot, really quite hot. I took this photo after I would just prang the car I was in. I drove the car into a pothole which burst two of its front tires and bent its axle. So I, it wasn't mine, <coughs> the owner was in it. So there's plenty of time to frame this picture of uh, rice growing and shows how warm it was. Other parts we collected were in the rain shadow of the Andes, which is incredibly dry. I think this is somewhere around Mendoza. And then in the south, in Patagonia, it's almost identical to Otago. So the point is that where we collected these parasitoids from was very, very varied. It was distributed far more widely in South America than we ever imagined. So I'll just talk to you a bit about its biology, and there's supposed to be a movie in this, but I'm not convinced. So here we have the um, parasitoid. And this might show how it attacks the weevils. So that's its stinger, that's its ovipositor being jammed into it. And down that microscopically fine hypodermic needle, the ovipositor, is a filamentous egg. Now, it's all a bit revolting, but it does lay eggs in its eye, or in its mouth, or in the interstices of the sclerites, anywhere it can get that ovipositor in. The interesting thing is, at first sight, it doesn't seem that the weevil makes the slightest bit of difference to get out of the way. It's a very odd biology. It's like the weevil can't see it. So the parasite will stalk it for quite a while. Anyway, in goes the egg. Sorry. In goes the egg here. 
very tiny, grows incredibly fast, turns into a first stage of the larva inside the weevil's body, all right? It goes through four stages and this huge larva comes out. It's a very, this is a standing joke, this weevil's having a bad hair day, right? Anyway, the weevil lives until this happens. So there's some incredible co-evolution such that the weevil can stay alive with a thing like that in it. That pupates and round it goes again. So that's the life history. About three, two and a half generations a year. Uh, you may, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about parasitism, so I better tell you how we measure it. When I first started doing this, I had one of these weevils the size of a match head uh, on a piece of glass with the two pairs of tweezers, these jeweler's forceps, right? And I couldn't make any sense of it. I'd spend a morning trying to dissect it. It just kept sliding around the place. When I finally opened it, it just looked like blancmange or something. There was nothing, no structures, nothing. So we had to think of something. So we came up with this business of embedding them in wax. That stops them moving, obviously. And um, that means then we can do this under salty water so we can tease apart the organs of the weevil and see what's going on. And so um, this, is, this is someone doing just that. And we can do about, I think doing, do about 20 an hour or 40 an hour, a lot. It's really very efficient. So here we have the egg again. In fact, you can see the embryonic larva in there. And then that's the first instar again. So we decided, we got permission to release it. So we started a mass rearing program as shown in this picture. We decided we had to release these parasitoids as infected weevils. So we would sprinkle these infected weevils on the pastures where the weevil is, because it lives on the surface, rather than try to release the parasite itself, which is incredibly delicate. So in the end, we reared a million of these infected weevils, and we released them all over New Zealand. And we released them in very high numbers because we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how many we had to release. So these, um, these, these ones here, we released 40 to 50,000 in one place. Usually we're releasing 20,000, 30,000, something like that. We did a pretty um, major release up here, Taranaki here, and then these little ones here are still around 10 to 30,000 per release. So we did a lot of releases. And it worked very well. Um, this work uh, is by Gary Barker, who's in the audience. And you can see in the Hamilton area, it built up very quickly. This is the time of release, and this was the rate of build up. And you can see in these places, it got to up to 90% which is hugely high uh, for a biocontrol agent. Happened somewhere else in the North Island, somewhere in Hamilton, and it also happened here. So this was an immediate uh, build-up of parasitism in the early 90s. And um, the levels were consistently high. And it worked. Uh, these are data, I think, collected from the North Island. So this is, these are the years, 91 to um, 95. This is the eggs per square meter that we were measuring in the field, larvae per square meter, and the adults per square meter. So we have had an effect. <coughs> so um, just a quick mention of the pastures we did this work in. They really are not really ecosystems. There are two species of grass that grow together, almost hydroponically. <clears throat> it is indeed a partial transplant of plants in European ecosystems, but it's nothing like the ecosystem these plants came out of. So it's very, very simple. And if you compare it to uh, grasslands in the um, native range of uh, the ryegrass and the clover, this is what they look like. So this is England. This is somewhere in Europe. I think it's where they made the sound of music. <laughs> this is a prairie. And here's New Zealand. You can see the difference. There's something quantitatively different. 
the very low biodiversity that our pastures have make it a cinch for the weevils to invade. So really they had very little or no competition for resources, that means grass. There are very few indigenous biocontrol agents here that were going to knock them out. There are few but nothing compared to where they came from. And there's plenty of food, obviously, and there's no biological pushback. So therefore, the whole country got smothered with these pests straight away. And this keeps happening because I believe the simple ecosystem allows these things in. I just want to say the numbers, as I said at the beginning, if we have 500 per square metre here, I couldn't actually find them in South America, except around hotel swimming pools and bars and places like that. <laughs> because they had improved grass, it's nothing to do with where I, why I was there. In fact, I had to collect them at night, which in these countries, when the generals were just disappearing, there was a lot of, lot of concern about who was I and what was I doing by the police, and it was quite difficult. So it's a great success, and we were nearly famous, actually, as Travis kindly pointed out. Why, were we, why, have, why did we do so well? Was it because we were really bright and really knew what we were doing? Probably not. I think we've come to the conclusion that the very thing that made our grasslands an, a cinch for the pest to get in also made it a cinch for the biocontrol agent to get it. So when we released these things, they went mad as well. They had hosts all over the place, weevils, and they didn't have any natural enemies either. They didn't even have any competitors. They had it all to themselves. So the percentage parasitism shot up in the way that I talked about. So what happened next? It all went wrong, completely wrong. And this sort of highlights it. These are the glory years, 73% or something north of Auckland, now five. This is percent parasitism. 73% in Waikato, now 20. 68% in this area, volcanic plateau, 3%. 58% here originally, still, still 40. But it collapsed. And we were getting reports of damage. That's that photo again. Um, Alison Pope discovered this, and I told her, don't be ridiculous. Um, it works perfectly. And she kept saying, no, I don't think it does. And in the end, I thought I may as well join her and get into the tent rather than deny it. And that's how this project began, really. So the next stage is this consternation and discovery. And this is the plan for this talk. Biocontrol efficacy had collapsed. And this is very, very rare in biocontrol. In fact, there's probably one other example in the literature. So what happened? We need to figure out what was going on. So we did field work and used old data from the 90s as a, some kind of baseline. We did lab studies and we did some DNA work. And from that, we've been forming hypotheses. So the field work and the old data. About three and a half years ago, we decided to assemble all the data we had and put it into a time series to see what the levels of parasitism have been for the last 25 years or so forth. So we can look for trends in parasitism levels and see what, what Earth's gone on. So this involves searching existing databases. AgriSearch has a lot. We didn't chuck it out, we kept it. And there's something to be said for conservation of data when you finish your project. Just keep it. Keep them, sorry. Data mining, we looked at our published material to see what we could pinch out of that and resurrect and convert some results back into levels of parasitism. We dissected frozen weevils we've had in the fridge since the mid-90s in, in the hyper deep freeze. So we were able to get data from the 90s from the frozen samples. And we did some more sampling. So this is us sampling. This is how we do it. This isn't posed or anything. I think, I think the camera was on a 
fence post. We had to pose for it while it photographed automatically. So you can see it's a really natural position we're in. <laughs> anyway, those things are leaf blowing machines working backwards that suck the ground instead of blow and everything gets sucked up into a sort of sock. And then we take that back to the lab and sort the weevils out and so forth. We have spent hours doing this. That's why my hearing is so bad. Anyway, we've done a lot, and this shows you where the sampling's been done in New Zealand over the years. So we've got a lot, a hell of a lot of data. And the data is almost indecipherable. This is the 1990s showing, showing um, densities of weevils per square metre and parasitism levels. And that's only a bit of it. That's about a third of the data. And we collected vast amounts, and I've got to pay tribute to my colleagues in agri-research for hanging on to this stuff. And we've published a lot, and as I said, we dug it out of the publications. And you can see there's a lot of different people involved, including Gary Barker, since he's here. It's um, quite impressive what we put out. So how can we make sense of all that data? All those data, sorry. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of fluctuation in the seasonality of these things. But it, there is a time in the winter when everything goes into hibernation. It's called diapause or oligopause. And um, during these winter periods, there's one here, one here, one here, 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 here. You can get a good idea of the level of overall activity because nothing's happening. There's no egg laying by the parasitoid. The weevils um, really just um, hibernating and not doing anything. So that gives you a snapshot of prevailing levels. So that enabled us to sort out all those fluctuations and get a proxy measure each year of what the level of parasite activity was. And as I said, the, the recent data that, that we collected with the vacuum cleaners, we also chucked into the pot. And this is the result we got. So here we have years after the uh, parasite have been released and here we have the overwintering levels of parasitism. Now this is across all of New Zealand. These data, this result comes from all of these data points. 196 sites, 18 regions, 11,000 weevils, 21 years of sampling. So these data are very dense. So these dots are the means. These, that is the upper 75% and the lower 25%. These are the range, these ones here. And you can see exactly what's happened. It looked like there was steady activity for about the first five or six years, and then it's just gone down. And I must acknowledge Federico, who's in the audience, who's a very, very good mathematician, who's done all these curve fittings and things. And I think without Federico, I would have put this in the bottom drawer because to analyze it in the extent, to the extent that he has, as I'll show you, uh, made a huge difference. So why the crash? So everybody had an idea. It was changed agriculture, new plant varieties, climate change, more dairying, some kind of disease in the weevil or the parasitoid, or, or has the weevil become genetically resistant to the parasitoid through selection pressure? As I said, in, well, as I, as I, I draw a comparison between that and resistance to antibiotics about, amongst bacteria. It's exactly the same process. So the susceptible weevils get kind of written off by the parasitoid and the toughies remain. That is one of the theories and that's something I'll be talking about. But before I do, I'll talk a bit about this mathematical analysis. This is interesting because Federico's work showed without doubt that the only influence on the decline in parasitism was the result of time going by. Latitude, altitude, slope, farming practice, age of pasture, types of animals, none of those things influenced the levels of parasitism. The only influence was the time passed since release. And we did a, an analysis here where we looked at the shape of the declines of the curves in all of these different places in New Zealand, and I can't remember what they are. That's North Canterbury, South Canterbury, mid, mid somewhere, uh, Marlborough. And 
we looked at the shape of the decline in all those places and these ones, Auckland, Waikat, WO, all those places. And um, <coughs> what we found was that the population decline shapes aggregated into two groups, this group and that group. And we found what determined those aggregations was how long the time had been since the populations of parasitoids had been released. So these ones were released early and these ones were released late. And it makes no, the, where they were released has got nothing to do with it. It was the time of release that led to these two bunches. And we did a, an experiment by mistake, which has turned out to be really useful. Uh, we were plotting the decline against the years, calendar years, and this one stuck out. This was a uh, wire wrapper. And it, well, it was annoying that it stuck out. And then we discovered that it had been released late. That wire wrapper population was released in 1998, not 1992. And when we recalibrated it in terms of years past since release, rather than the year, it fitted. So that was up there in that sequence because it was released later and was still on the way down. But when you look at it in terms of how long it was since the release was made, it fitted the trend. It definitely has something to do with the time since release. So was it climate change? Is it climate change? Change in phonology, the change in the relationship between the generations? Well, we don't think so. This is 1997 in, in part of the year, and you can see the shape. This is 2014, it's the same shape. So it looks very much like the generations are still interacting in exactly the same way. And in fact, the weather here now is about as warm as it was in Waikato in the 90s. So it's not uncoupling of generations. So of course the uh, plant variety endo endophyte thing came up and we were able to piggyback on someone else's experiment where they were looking at various combinations of various varieties of ryegrass and various strains of endophyte. And we measured the levels of parasitism in the weevils in the same block, in the same paddock really, on these different types of grasses and endophytes. And we found absolutely no difference at all in the parasitism levels. This one is One of these has got no uh, endophyte free. These round ones, this one here, is endophyte free. In fact, it's, and these are the various endophytic grasses. Sorry. This is really going wrong now. And all the others, anyway, it showed there was no effect of endophyte, which was quite a surprise. So we did a bit of modeling and we didn't have much money, so we did a quick and dirty model. But what we did, well I didn't, what we did as a group, is we got the biological parameters, the length of life, how many eggs they lay, how fast they fly, everything we think of, and we put them into a model. And that produced this line here, and it, it predicted an equilibrium of around 60%, actually it was around 70, but it ain't bad. And we started jiggling around with the variables, fecundity, searching efficiency, now, fecundity, um, longevity, temperature related activity, all of those things. And if we jiggled around with those variables, nothing happened. The line stayed like that. If we changed the attack rate or changed what we call the searching efficiency, the parasite, down it went. That is indicative of the parasitoid no longer being able to find the weevil and therefore the weevil's becoming resistant. So the model predicted surprisingly well what we've been observing. So then we started to get onto the idea that perhaps the weevil is resistant, partly because the weevil is more evasive. There's a behavioral thing going on and the parasitoid is not attacking as efficiently as it was. So we did some lab studies to check this out. And what we did is we got two types of grass there's uh, Lolium perenni, which farmers use everywhere, and there's another grass, Lolium multiflorum, which is a short rotation, high nutrition sort of grass. And we put 23 weevils in each of these boxes, suitably replicated, with two parasitoids. 
And we got quite a surprising result. In the Lolium multiflorum, which is that high rotation nutritious grass, the parasitism was around 70%. In the Lolium perenni, which we see in most of our pastures, and in a hybrid between the perenni and the multiflorum, we got around 48%. So it became clear that the grass had something to do with the attack rates. So everybody said, oh, that's because the grass looks different, it grows differently, there's an architectural feature of those two grasses that changes the attack rate. So we, grew, we did the experiment with the grass lying on its side, so clearly it wasn't necessarily architectural. We got exactly the same results. So the grass itself is affecting the rate at which the parasitoid attacks the weevils. We found exactly the same thing in the field. This is multiflorum, and this is the common garden perenni over a year. So this is the thing. Here's the usual New Zealand pasture. Here's this tetraploid multiflorum. Now a big difference, and this is quite important to us, this difference in those two grasses between the perenni and the multiflorum wasn't happening in the 1990s. In the 1990s, we had the same attack rate in the perenni as we do in the multiflorum. In fact, the attack rate in the multiflorum now isn't very different from what we had in the 1990s. The attack rate in the perenni is down 40%, 50%. So something's going on. Something's happened in those intervening years. So we think that the model we did and the effect of grass type indicates a behavioral shift in the weevils. So Steve Ratton and a PhD student were starting to make videos of the behavior of the parasite on the weevil and the weevil on these different grasses to see what's going on, to see what the mechanism is for this decline in parasitism. So the last bit we did was genetic studies. And I have to uh, be very grateful to Jan Jacobs in Ag Research uh, for letting me into her program to try out this stuff. Our works coincided with this uh, next generation sequencing, this very rapid sequencing of DNA, of DNA and the base pairs. There's a new system developed which we're testing out called genotyping by sequencing, which isn't a terribly imaginative name, but it's a brilliant method for looking at differences in populations and looking at differences in the genetics of populations. So I won't explain how that works, except to say it's very, very effective at picking up genetic differences. So we did a quick, another quick experiment. We're doing a much more elaborate one, but initially we collected four populations of weevils. We got them from two at uh, where there's very low parasite pressure for whatever reason. We got them from Karamea, where there's very low parasitism. We got them from Ruakura, where there's been a lot of uh, selection pressure by the parasitoid, and we got them from Lincoln. Now this is, each one of these is a weevil, these numbers. And looking at the, um, looking at the single nucleotide polymorphisms, the single changes in the base pairs to classify these weevils, they aggregated. So the lot we got from Tuatapri were very similar to each other, but nothing like these ones. The ones we got from Karamea were very similar to each other, but nothing like the Tuatapri ones or these ones. So the first thing we found, there is genetic variation in Argentine stem weevil in New Zealand, far more than we realized. We're gonna do another 12 of these to really nail this. But the interesting thing was that the Lincoln, the Lincoln weevils, and the Ruakura weevils are genetically very, very similar. So the question is then, have we got convergent evolution? Has the selection pressure driven the genes in these weevils into a certain and common direction such that they become similar to each other? So putting it crudely, are the weevils with the susceptible genes that allow themselves to get attacked being knocked out of the population and we've just got the, and we've just got the resistant ones left and that same thing's happened here as happened at Ruakura, which is why these things overlap.
So why is the efficiency of the parasitoid dropping on the basis of all that stuff? Well, what it's not, it's not endophyte, it's not climate change. There's no immune response. Sometimes parasitoids eggs inside the weevil's bodies or the insect bodies become what's called encapsulated. No sign of that, we've done 11,000. So it's not that. So we've got to look at the hypothesis about what's going on. So the big question really is, has the parasitoid been so efficient that it's actually driven itself out of the game by creating resistance? Now, there's a lot of skepticism about what I just said because, as I said, failure of classical biocontrol is incredibly rare. And the reasons for this are, are reasonable, are obvious, really. Usually, when you've got a biocontrol system, if the host, like the weevil, becomes resistant, the parasite changes. So if the host evolves resistant, the parasite evolves resistance to get around that. So you get this tandem development, which stops resistance establishing, because you've got this, they call it a evolutionary arms race, right? There's other things going on. Most ecosystems have places where the susceptible weevils, or whatever they are, can avoid being parasitized. We don't. Our, our pastures are really monotonous. So the idea of refugia or places that the uh, susceptible weevils can hide doesn't work here. They're wide open to being attacked all the time. And the other thing we don't have that often happens in the native range is we don't have guilds of biocontrol agents. Usually a pest is suppressed in the native range like South America by a whole bunch of things operating at once. Here, we've got one biocontrol agent, the parasitoid, and one pest. So the selection pressure is really sharp. It's really focused. So our situation is unusual, as I've just said. Very high selection pressure for 25 years. One control agent, no refugia. Species poor with few natural enemy guilds. And being species poor, there's nothing to deflect the attention of Microtose hyperodi on the weevil. It's full on. So the evidence indicates that declined since time decline in the most common ryegrass, Lolium perenni, and the possible convergence of genetics. The Lolium perenni thing's really interesting because the lack of efficacy in perenni has only occurred in the last few years. So things have changed. But the most compelling thing of a lot, and I think you may have noticed me going on about it, the weevil is re reproducing sexually. It can evolve itself out of the way of the parasitoid. Parasitoid's stuck in its groove. It's got no ability to move as the weevil moves genetically, so it's stuck. So it's starting to lose its mojo. So we've got a perfect evolutionary storm going on in our pastures. Very high selection pressure, adaptive ability of the parasitoids much less than the weevil, and the very low diversity in our pastoral ecosystems means that all kinds of things happen such that resistance can occur. We think there's a, probably a change in behavior because that's the least complicated evolutionary response. Now this thing doesn't change behavior because it's sentient. It changes because its genes have changed. It doesn't sort of think. It doesn't learn. It just changes its DNA and does what its DNA tells it to do. Another thing is you would predict that the resistance will be most common in perennial ryegrass because that's the ryegrass that covers 90% of New Zealand not the other one. And yeah, whatever we're measuring is showing up far more in perennial ryegrass, so that fits. And that's what we found. So what are the lessons here? I don't think we should treat New Zealand pastures like a proper ecosystem. Things happen here because of the simplicity of our grasslands that don't happen in a balanced and evolved ecosystem. We have a worse pest in New Zealand called clover root weevil which has been estimated to be about 440 million a year. It knocks out white clover. White clover is incredibly important for our environment as well as farming to try to do something about excessive use of synthetic nitrogen. Now that is being dealt with by another biocontrol agent called Microtonus ethiopoides, which you might, no which you might notice looks a bit like the one I was talking about. They're both in the same genus. And yes, this one is parthenogenetic as well. 
So we've got even higher selection pressure on clover root. We've around 90% by this other parasitoid in exactly the same ecosystem. So the question is, will it or when will it go the same way as Argentine stem weevil? So we're looking out for it. And one of the things we can do based on our understanding of what's gone on with stem weevil is see if we can see the early signs of it going on in clover root weevil. So ironically then, the thing that made the parasitoid so successful now has led to its failure. It's too successful. It's very rare and very unusual, but so are our pastures very unusual. So if it's going to happen anyway, it may as well happen here. And the lesson really is that we can't take biocontrol for granted in New Zealand just because it started to work. We don't know where it's going to go. And this is, to me, the first long study of a biocontrol agent that um, New Zealand's seen. And we're very lucky to have been able to do it. It's more, yeah, by good luck, really, that we came back to something we did in the 90s to discover this. There is another parasite that works really well on another weevil in Lucerne. And it worked really well in the 1980s. It was released by DSIR. That, that weevil, that parasite that works well in Lucerne, because we released another one in Lucerne, that worked really well in the 1980s. It's a sexually reproducing parasitoid. It's still working really well in the Lucerne. So whatever happened in the Lucerne, if there was any evolution with the weevil in the Lucerne, the parasitoid must have moved with it. So it just shows the difference between the parthenogenetic population and a sexually reproducing population of biocontrol agents. Thank you very much. You've looked at variation, genetic variation in the parasitoid or, or the weevil populations and how that shifted over time. Uh, is there evidence for resistance in the, in, uh, the breeding populations or the cultivars uh, across time and whether that's changed or not? Which populations? Uh, well, the uh, ryegrass or other grasses. No, well, what happens with the ryegrass? It's a very good question. Uh, the ryegrass keeps getting renewed and plant breeders are breeding it all the time for um, productivity and so forth. So the natural selection and processes in the host, the plant, don't really go on. And in fact, our pastures don't last that long, so they're constantly being renewed. And the endophyte thing interferes with that process as well. Your last statement, as you finished, was the most important, Steve, that um, the parasitoid for Lucerne is still working. So I'm very pleased to hear that. Uh, my concern is that we've got a dairy industry that's really worried about pasture persistence because the farmers have come to them and said in the last decade all your new cultivars aren't surviving and we're putting it down to grazing pressure and mismanagement and droughts etc. Is it simply that Argentine stem weevil has come back to do what it did 25 years ago? Yeah, well we've got a sustainable farming fund program going on specifically to try to find that out. <clears throat> and it's, I don't think the biocontrol agent is having any effect at all on the attack rates and damage rates caused by Argentine stem weevil. So the answer is we're back to where we were. You hinted at um, behaviour change being a possibility but didn't explain how the behaviour might change. How do the, how do the weevils escape what are detection they doing? and what are they doing differently on those two different ryegrasses? And second, did you give any thought to anatomical changes? Are they getting thicker exocelatins or doing anything to stop the ovipositor getting in? So I heard the first question. Um, <laughs> um, how, it, how it's changed its behaviour is the subject of a PhD associated with the Centre of Excellence. We've got some pretty flashy photography work. We're going to have a very difficult job trying to see how it's changed. And we, but fortunately, we have the perennial ryegrass and the tetraploid ryegrass as a comparison. If we collect enough data, we might figure it out. At the moment, we don't know. So what was the second bit? What about anatomical changes in terms of making it harder for the ovipositor to get in? Well, we haven't looked at that. Very good idea. Thank you for suggesting it. Another <laughs> PhD. <laughs> um, a beautifully crafted uh, address and example yeah, to us all. Uh, the question I have is, um, you said that the uh, stem weevil 
had a number of predators uh, in South America, not just the one that you grabbed. Um, can you please go back there and find a, another three or four and make sure they sexually reproduce? I don't want to go back there. <laughs> it was pretty, ho pretty hard because, because I'd say the one I talked about is the only one by the swimming pools <laughs> and I don't know what else is there, but there will be other stuff. Yeah. And that is one way out of jail is to find other ecotypes or uh, other control agents altogether. You know. Uh, so, sort of related to that, Steve, um, it's going to take a while to find a you know, sexually active wasp. In, in the meantime, is there any cultural practice that we can change? I mean, should we have refugia strips in our, on our farms or in our pastures, for example? Uh, this, possibly. I think we've lost, kind of lost the uh, susceptibility of the Argentine stem weevil. It does raise questions about doing something in case the same thing happens with clover root weevil, for sure. <clears throat> I think the management of the pastures with refugia is an issue, or you could change the pasture composition, but we have to accept that farmers are farming for productivity, so there's only so much we can kind of ask before they start losing profitability. So we're kind of stuck with the ryegrass clover thing in many ways. Um, but there's been a lot of conversation with my colleagues about increasing the biodiversity in hedgerows and uh, in the pasture itself. Well, one of the things that I didn't mention but is I think quite interesting is, yeah, sure, you have huge areas of pasture in the United States and in Britain and Europe. <clears throat> but the point about those is the hedgerows and the headlands still have biocontrol agents in them that affect pests. Ours don't. Because ryegrass and clover didn't evolve here, the natural ecosystem doesn't contain the regulators that the natural ecosystem does in the native range. So it's a completely different ecology. And it's that which I think that we've got to come to grips with when we do agronomy and pest management and all the other aspects. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, great talk. Um, is there any way that you can clarify whether there was genetic diversity in the parasitoids you collected or stole from South America. Um, have we got a collection to go back, like you've done the comparison of the four sites in New Zealand, can you determine whether that variability existed when you bought them here? Um, we can now. Louise Winder, who's in the front, spent 20 years trying to answer your question. Now we've got this GBS thing. We think we can type the parasitoids. So there's two things going on. We collected from nine places, and we collected about 12 clonal lines from each of the nine places. So we don't know what went on within those nine populations and between them. What we did as a big, mighty experiment was release equal numbers of everything everywhere in New Zealand. So we could see which ones did best where. So for example, did the Brazilians do best in Northland, and the Patagonian ones do best in Otago? We did that, released them 25 years ago. We now can go back and figure it out. We did two other things. We kept the original parasitoids that we released in the deep freeze so we can look at their DNA now. It will be the same, but we can work out which ones did best. The other thing we did is keep the weevils we collected before the parasite was released in the deep freeze. So we can get them out of the deep freeze and look at their DNA and compare it to these from Lincoln and compare it to weevils we can get from Lincoln now and see if there's been a shift. So that's work that's coming up. That should help the hypothesis and solidify it. So this is actually, it's pretty exciting really if this is a second uh, case of this occurring, but it's really quite a unique situation where it comes back to that question. Because of the success of the program, it was the one option that was introduced and you didn't, it was so successful, it almost stalled the opportunity to have a multi-attack a multi, a multi sort of approach to this. And I assume, based on a genetic drift scenario, that would have extended the life of any one sort of uh, parasitoid oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and multiplied it out over time. Mm. Uh, so it really possibly is a huge lesson if this is uh, our genetic drift scenario where a one solution 
answer will never actually possibly work, especially if there's no uh, diversity in the parasitoid. So it's really, really interesting. Well, certainly the parasite is a sort of one-trick pony, right, to mix the animals. Um, the big danger is when they reproduce clonally. I mean, it's risky enough bringing one thing in that's sexual in its reproduction to, to bring something clonal in. And what we did do, we weren't completely daft, we brought a lot of range of those clones from all those different places. But we don't know what's going on. There may be one and only one's made it. We just don't know. The, the idea about bringing adjunct or other species in is that we run straight into the EPA thing around non-target impacts and all the rest of it. And it's also, we spent a million proving that that hyperoide wasn't going to knock out native species and so on. So it's quite complicated. But my feeling is that we need to look hard at the biology of the biocontrol agents we've got. And we've got to persuade the funders that you can't just do biocontrol, tick the box and move on. You just can't. Join with me and thanks Dave one more time.